Well, good morning and a warm welcome to your service today. It's good to see you. Uh, again, just let me run through the announcements. Uh, we meet for prayer this evening in this Nelson room behind the sound desk at 6.30 before our service of worship at 7 o'clock. And so do join us this evening as we worship God together. Uh, then tomorrow night, the, the PW is having its uh, opening meeting uh, in the Dunlop Hall at 7.45. Uh, the speaker is Michael McBrien uh, from the Mercy Ships. And uh, all ladies are very welcome. Again, uh, please note you don't need to be a member of the PW to come along. Uh, anyone can come along. So if you're interested to hear about that work, uh, then you'd be very welcome. Uh, there's going to be supper afterwards. Uh, so if you're intending to come, please add your name to the sheet in the foyer. Uh, just to help uh, with the, the catering so they know how many to expect. Uh, then the bright hour is on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, Russell Coates is the speaker this week and all ladies are welcome. Uh, please speak to Madeline if you need transport. Uh, then we have our midweek Bible study and prayer meeting on Wednesday at 7.45. And uh, choir practice for the Harvest Thanksgiving Choir will take place this Thursday at 7.30. And the men's uh, Friday night uh, prayer meeting uh, will be on, on Friday at 7 o'clock in the Nelson Room. And then uh, next Sunday we have our Harvest Thanksgiving services and uh, the BB enrollment. It's going to be on Sunday the 23rd of October. And our next communion service will be Sunday the 30th of October if you want to put those dates in your diary. But next Sunday, Harvest Thanksgiving. Uh, of course, we all know about the uh, cost of living crisis. Uh, if anyone in the congregation is uh, under financial pressure, if you're finding things difficult, uh, you could speak to me in, in private uh, because there's some money available in the uh, benevolent fund. Uh, not a lot of money, but uh, some anyway to help people. So do speak to me about that if, if you need some assistance. Uh, don't forget the Vine Center's Winter Coat Project. Uh, so they're looking for winter coats, halves, scarves, and gloves. Uh, if you can help with that, then you can uh, see Joe, Joe Fittis, or you can go and leave the, the stuff in uh, the Vine Center there on the uh, Crumlin Road. Uh, but it needs to be in before the 14th of October because that's when they, that's going to start to distribute them. So winter coats, hats, scarves, and gloves, please, to the Vine Center. Uh, please speak to me if anyone uh, in the congregation is thinking about becoming a communicant member of the church. So you might be a member but not a communicant and you're thinking about uh, what it means to be a communicant and how to become one. Please speak to me about that if that's you. And then Simon's going to come and speak to us uh, about the Boys Brigade. Good morning. Um, I'm just up here on behalf of the boys of the company section. Uh, they wanted to lay down a challenge to the men of the congregation. Um, on Friday the 21st of October, they are challenging all the men in the congregation to come down and compete against them uh, in volleyball, pool, um, table tennis, penalties and a few other games. Um, to be honest, they're very, very confident that they'll beat you. Okay? Um, so there, there's a couple of reasons for doing this. Uh, we, Obviously, as I said, they're very confident they'll beat you. I think a quote on Friday night was, sure, they're only old men. So if that's a spur to, to make you come down, so be it. Um, secondly, obviously, as, as Colin has just announced there, our enrollment is on the 23rd. Um, so we'd like, whenever the boys come down for enrollment, that they'll recognise a few faces, hopefully, that they'll have played against on the Friday night. So if you're interested in coming down, um, we're an open invitation, regardless of age, to every man, every man in the congregation, come down on uh, Friday the 21st of October from 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock. Uh, challenge against the boys will be a trophy for the winning team at the end, uh, and we're hoping to do this three times throughout the year. So even if we beat you in the first night, you'll maybe be able to come back later on uh, and beat us again, and there might be a hot dog or two at the end. So if you'd like to take part, and we're encouraging everybody to come down to take part, uh, speak to myself or any of the officers, and uh, we'll get a team together uh, to, to face the boys. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Uh, we're here to worship God. In Psalm 96, it says, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Uh, let's uh, praise God together. Let's stand to sing uh, from Psalm 96. Oh, sing a new song to the Lord.
Let's bow before God in prayer. Let's pray. And we bow in your presence, uh, Lord God Almighty, and worship you because you are the one true and living God, the everlasting God who rules and reigns over all that you have made in the heavens above and on the earth below. And with the psalmist and all your people, we praise you because there is no other God like you. Everything you do is marvelous, and you've brought salvation to us by sending your one and only Son into the world to deliver us from our sin and misery, and then by sending your Spirit into our lives to enable us to repent and believe. And so we praise you for our salvation and for the victory that you have won for us over sin and Satan and death, and for the great hope that you've given us of the resurrection and everlasting life in your presence, where we'll come before you with thanksgiving to worship you forever and forever. And as we gather in your presence today, we pray that you will minister to each one of us according to our need. Will you work through the reading and preaching of your word and through the prayers we offer in order to strengthen our faith in Christ and to enlarge our love for one another? Will you comfort us with the promises of your word and will you reassure us of your goodwill towards us? And we pray that you will accept our worship today and we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. We've been reading through the book of Exodus, so uh, please turn with me to uh, Exodus chapter 5. <coughs> Uh, Exodus chapter 5, I'm going to read to verse 9 of chapter 6. So uh, God has appeared to Moses at the burning bush and instructed him to, to go and speak to the Pharaoh about uh, bringing his people out of their captivity. And uh, Exodus chapter 5, verse 1, this is the word of the Lord. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous and you're stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and foremen in charge of the people. You're no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw. But require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the men so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Then the slave drivers and the foremen went out and said to the people, this is what Pharaoh says, I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, Complete the work required of you for each day, just as when you had straw. The Israelite foremen appointed by Pharaoh's slave drivers were beaten and were asked, Why didn't you meet your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? Then the Israelite foreman went and appealed to Pharaoh, Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are, lazy. That is why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. The Israelite foremen realized that they were in trouble when they were told you're not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them, and they said, May the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. 
Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you brought trouble upon this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble upon this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they lived as aliens. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and cruel bondage. Amen. And we thank God for his word to us today. Let's turn to God in prayer again, this time to confess our sins. Let's pray. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love and according to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin, for we know our transgressions and how from our childhood until this very day we have sinned against your law by our sinful thoughts and words and desires and deeds which are too many to count. We confess that you are righteous, but we are covered in shame because every day we turn away from your commands and we do what is wrong. Instead of loving, trusting, and worshiping you above all other things, we have so often put other things before you. Instead of loving our neighbor as ourselves, we have so often hurt them by the things we have said and done. Instead of fighting with all our might against every temptation, we have so often given in to temptation. Instead of walking in your ways, we have so often followed the ways of the world. Instead of living upright and holy lives, we have so often given in to the desires of our sinful nature. Heavenly Father, we are sorry. We're sorry for all the ways we have broken your law and for all the ways we have fallen short of doing your will, we repent of all our sins and ask that you will forgive us our sins for the sake of Christ who loved us and who gave up his life for us. And so for his sake, will you remove our sins from us as far as the east is from the west? Will you cover them over? Will you blot them out? Will you remember them no more? Will you give to all who trust in your Son the joy of knowing that we have been pardoned? And will you fill us with your Spirit to help us to love you, our faithful Father, and to love your law, so that our heart's desire will be to obey you in all things? And we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. And having confessed our sins, hear the good news from Isaiah 53. Surely he, that's the Lord Jesus, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Thanks be to God for his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Let me invite the boys and girls to come up to the front. Well done. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, so, anything interesting happened this past week you want to tell me about? 
Yes. You're going to two parties. Okay. And uh, are they friends, family? Who's having the party? The parties. Hmm? Your family are having parties. Okay. Fantastic. Good. Are you looking forward to it? What do you think you'll do? Will you play games or will you just talk to people? Will you eat? Go down slides. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. What about anybody else? Anything want to tell me? Anything else interesting happen? No. No. Your hands sort of half up, but no, staying down. Okay, right. Well, uh, I've been telling you about the Lord Jesus. Today, though, we're, we're thinking about somebody else. Uh, and this is a story from the book of Acts. So do you know your books in the Bible? In the New Testament, you've got the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then you've got the book of Acts. And the book of Acts, it's all about the things that the apostles did after Jesus went back up into heaven. And uh, here are some of the people, the apostles and the, the people in the early church, and they're talking together. What they did in those days is um, some of, the, some of the, the Christians, they were very poor, so they didn't have much money, they didn't have much food. And so the other Christians were trying to help them. And so in the church, they gave, they gave meals to people who couldn't afford to, to buy any food themselves. And, uh, but there were more and more people being added to the church. More and more people were becoming Christians. And so they were finding it hard to cope with this, all of these people who were coming. And somebody had to make sure that all the people who needed meals every day got their meals every day. And so they were talking about this, what they were going to do, because some people were missing out. They weren't getting the food that they needed. And that wasn't right, so what could they do about it? So there they are, they're talking about it. They're trying to decide what to do. And then the, the apostles, and this is one of the apostles. Do you know any of the names of the apostles? You've got people, people like Peter and John, the disciples of Jesus, Peter and John, and, and people like that. And so here's one of them, and he stood up, and he said, listen, this is what we're going to have to do. Because we apostles... The Lord Jesus told us to go and preach the gospel. We have to tell people about Jesus. That's our job. So uh, we have to have the time to do that. And so we can't watch over uh, the people as they come for meals and to get food because that's be too much for us to do. And we wouldn't be able to do our main job, which is to preach about Jesus. So what we should do is we should appoint other people to do that work and they can make sure that all the people who need food get food and so they talked about this together and they said what we need is we need to get seven men who are godly they're full of the holy spirit and they're full of wisdom so they, they know what to do uh, we need to appoint them to look after uh, the food and um, whenever people come looking for food they can make sure that everybody gets enough and we can carry on doing our work, which is to preach the gospel. And so they chose the seven men. They decided who they were, the seven men who were godly, full of the Holy Spirit, very wise. And uh, they knelt down. You can see them kneeling down. And the apostles put their hands on them and prayed for them and appointed them as deacons. They became deacons. And so it was their job then to look after the poor, the poor believers, to make sure that they always had enough so that's that. There were seven of them. One of them was called Stephen, and he's the one we're going to focus on. Stephen, he's the guy in the blue. Uh, and uh, it says in the book of Acts how he, he was filled with the Spirit, and God enabled him to do really special things. So just as Jesus was able to heal people, and some of the apostles were able to heal people, so Stephen was able to heal people. So here's a man. You see he's got crutches. So he wasn't able to walk, and then Stephen was able to perform a miracle, and he was able to walk again. Wow, it was the power of God. So he was able to do that, and then he was able to uh, talk to people about the Lord Jesus. So here are some people who didn't believe, and they came, and they were sort of saying about how they didn't believe in the Lord Jesus. They didn't believe that Jesus had risen from the dead, and Stephen was given wisdom from God to answer all of their questions and all of their objections, all the things that they said, well, we don't believe, we don't believe. And Stephen was able to say, no, you've got it wrong. And he was able to explain to them the good news about Jesus. So he was able to do that because the Holy Spirit helped him. But lots of people then didn't like Jesus. The people who didn't believe, uh, the people who didn't believe didn't like Stephen. And uh, they began to tell lies about him. And uh, they just got him in trouble. And uh, so here he was, he was arrested. You see the guards there with their spears. He was arrested and he was brought before the court. And uh, when he was brought before the court, people again began to tell lies and accuse him of saying things that he shouldn't have said. 
and uh, they got really angry with him. And uh, there's Stephen just uh, listening to all of these things that they were saying about, saying about him. But then it says how uh, Stephen began to speak, and he began to say to them, you know what, uh, you're just like the Jews in the past. The Jews in the past didn't listen to Moses. So when Moses was on the earth, and he was a leader of God's people, they didn't listen to him. And they didn't listen to him when he said how God was going to send a Savior into the world. They didn't listen to Moses. So you're just like them. And then when the Savior did come, you killed him. When Jesus came to the earth, you killed him. So you're just like the Jews in the past. You don't listen to God. Uh, so uh, you should listen to God and you should repent of all your sins. And as Stephen said this, the people got really angry with him. Because they were saying, what, you think we're like the Jews in the past who didn't listen to, to, to Moses? We're not like them at all. And they got really angry with him. And uh, it says how whenever they were getting angry with Stephen, he looked up to heaven. He looked up to heaven. And uh, he had a vision of heaven. Now, when we look up, we can't see heaven. But he looked up and he saw heaven. And he says he saw the glory of God. So he saw God in heaven. And it says he saw the Lord Jesus standing beside the throne of God in heaven. That's what he was able to see. Uh, but the people down below, they were just getting angry with him. And they got so angry with him. Do you know what they did? They dragged him out of the city. And they began to stone him. Great big stones. And they began to throw it upon him. Uh, they were trying to kill him. And it says how uh, Stephen, he began to pray. And he said, Jesus, receive my spirit. He says, you know, come and take me away. And then he said, will you forgive these people for what they're doing? Do you remember when the Lord Jesus was on the cross? And people hated him and they were killing him. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Well, here's Stephen saying the same thing. Will you forgive them? These people who are killing me, will you forgive them? And will you come and take me away? And, uh, oh, there he is praying. Yep, there he is praying. And they kept stoning him until he died. And so Stephen is the first martyr. So he's the first Christian who ever died for their faith. And a uh, terrible thing happened to him. But we know that he's in heaven with the Lord Jesus. But I want to go back to these pictures. You see, uh, the Holy Spirit enabled Stephen to do remarkable things. So do you remember he was able to heal people? Uh, he was able to heal people. Then he was given great wisdom to be able to answer these people who didn't believe. And whenever they said, said we don't believe, he was able to explain why they were wrong. And, uh, and then another remarkable thing. He died. Not many of us will ever have to die for our faith, thankfully. But he died for his faith because people hated him so much. So Stephen was able to do these remarkable things. Really special things. But in Children's Church today, I think you're going to hear this. Uh, Go back to the beginning, the beginning of the story, whenever they were chosen. Do you remember what they were chosen to do? The seven men, they were chosen to do something. They were chosen to make sure uh, the poor people had enough food to eat, which is really a very ordinary thing to do, isn't it? It's really a very ordinary thing to do. And so Stephen was able to do all these really remarkable things, but also he did these really ordinary things. He just cared for people. He loved people. He made sure that the poor people had enough to eat. And so what you might hear in Children's Church today is uh, how that's what we can do. Sometimes God helps us to do remarkable things, really special things. But he also just wants us to do ordinary things, to help people, to love the people around us, to serve them. So you can do that at home. You can help your parents maybe around the house. Or when you're in school, you can help the teacher. Or you can help your friends. Or whatever it is, uh, we can help people. And uh, the Lord Jesus is pleased when we help people and love people and serve them because we love him. That's what he wants us to do. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, this, this story of Stephen. And uh, it's a terrible thing that happened to him. All those people hated him and they killed him. But we know that he's now with you in heaven. And we thank you, Father, that you promise eternal life to all of your people. Thank you, Lord God, that sometimes we're able to do very special things, remarkable things, extraordinary things, but also we're able to serve you just in ordinary things, like helping the people around us. And so will you help the boys and girls to do that every day, that because they love you, they want to love the people around them. 
And we ask, Lord God, that you'll help them now in children's church and that you'll help them throughout the week in all that they do. Keep them safe and well and, and bring them back here again next Sunday. And we ask it all in our Savior's name. Amen. Great, do you want to go back to your seats and we'll sing our next song, which is uh, What a Wonderful Savior's Jesus. for boys and girls to go out to Children's Church. Let's turn to God again in prayer with our prayers of intercession. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Father, in our prayers of intercession, we want to pray again for the Prime Minister and her cabinet, asking that you'll give them all the, the wisdom and the help they need as they seek to govern this country and as they respond to the cost of living crisis and all the other concerns uh, which face them. Uh, we pray too for the leaders of the nations across the world, uh, asking that you will guide and direct them according to your most holy and perfect will, and that you would uh, enable them uh, to do what is uh, good and right and, and pleasing in your sight. And uh, we ask, Lord God, that they would use their authority uh, for good and not for evil. And we pray that you'll help them to be peacemakers keeping the peace within their own nation and keeping the peace with neighboring nations. And we pray too for all those who are suffering because of the war in Ukraine. And we ask that you'll bring that war to an end. We pray now for those in our own country who are struggling because of the cost of living crisis. We think of those whose businesses have gone out of business. We think of those whose businesses are struggling. We think of people who are finding it hard to make ends meet and who are anxious about the future and how they can afford to pay their bills. Heavenly Father, we believe that you are the source of every good thing and so we look to you to help us and to provide for us. And we pray that people across the country will not only receive your help, but they will know that it has come to them from you so that they will praise you and give thanks to you for it. 
And we pray now for all those people who help us in our daily lives, help those who work in our hospitals and surgeries and who help us when we're unwell. We pray for those who work in our nursing and caring homes and who care for the elderly and infirm. We pray for those who work in our schools and colleges and who teach our children. We pray for those who build and maintain our homes. We pray for those who provide us with food to eat. We pray for the police and those who work in the law courts and who maintain law and order. We pray for the councillors and those who work for our councils, who run our city and towns. Heavenly Father, there's so many people that we rely on each day, and we thank you for them, and we ask that you'll help them as they perform their duties. And we pray for one another, asking that you'll help us each day. Will you fill our lives with uh, every good thing that we need? And we pray that you'll help us to remain faithful to you, and that we would bring glory and honor to you by the way that we live our lives each day. We pray for our children, asking that they will walk in your ways all the days of their lives and help our young people to know what we believe and why we believe it. And uh, we pray that you will enable us all to be able to give an answer for the hope that we have when people ask us for it. We pray for those who have wandered from the sea of your in his church, and we plead with you to bring them back to Christ and his church. And we pray that you'll prevent the devil from coming among us and leading any of us away from the safety of your church. And then finally, we pray for the extension of Christ's kingdom throughout the world. Will you send out preachers into all the world to declare the unsearchable riches of Christ? And will you enable those who hear to repent and to believe so that they receive forgiveness and the hope of eternal life and so that they might be added to your church? And we ask all of these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Before we uh, read from God's Word, let's uh, stand to sing, There is a Hope.
And uh, Derek's going to read from uh, 1 John chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, um, turn with me to 1 John chapter 2 as we uh, read God's Word together. 1 John chapter 2, commencing at verse 12. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Amen. Let's pray for a moment. Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Uh, well, two weeks ago, uh, we were looking at that part of uh, John's first letter where he referred to, the, to three false claims which certain people were making about sin. Uh, the first false claim was that some, people, that some people were making was that sin doesn't matter, uh, so we can have a relationship with God and keep on sinning because sin doesn't matter. Uh, the second false claim that some people were making was that, well, I'm not a sinner. I have no sin. There's no sin in me. And the third false claim that some people were making was that, well, I haven't sinned. Uh, while we're all sinners in theory, uh, nevertheless, I haven't sinned. Other people may sin, but not me. And John responded to each of those uh, three false claims one by one. And then in last week's passage, uh, John referred three times to uh, people who claim to be believers. He referred to those who say that they know God. He referred to those who say they live in God, that is, they claim to uh, live in fellowship with God. And he referred to those who say they are in the light, that is, they claim to be in the light of the new age to come. Uh, those who said such things were claiming that they were believers. But how can anyone who makes such a claim know whether or not they really know God and live in him and are in the light. How can they be sure? And John explained that the way to know whether or not you know God and live in God and live in the light is whether or not you want to obey God and whether or not you love God's people. The person who claims to know God but who doesn't want to do what he commands is a liar, says John. The person who claims to live in fellowship with God must walk as Jesus did. That is, they must walk in obedience to God as Jesus obeyed his heavenly Father. And the person who claims to be in the light but who hates his Christian brother or sister is still in the darkness. And that person is stumbling around in the dark and before they know it, they'll stumble and fall to their eternal destruction. And so that's how we know that we really believe and are not deceiving ourselves and other people. Do we want to obey God? Do we love God's people? Those who do want to obey God and who love his people should give thanks to God because he's the one who transformed us and made us like that. And those who uh, don't want to obey God and uh, who don't love God's people, well, they must turn from their sin and repentance and they must turn to the Savior, trusting in him and in him alone in order to receive forgiveness from God and the free gift of eternal life. 
Now, I don't think I said it last week, but John probably had certain people in mind when he said uh, these things about people uh, deceiving themselves and about their relationship uh, to God. Uh, it seems from what John says in his letter that there were certain people in the early church who, who claimed to be believers. In fact, they claimed to be teachers, but they weren't true believers and they weren't true teachers because they didn't believe the true gospel, which has uh, come to us from the apostles, and uh, they didn't live obedient lives. And so John wanted to warn his readers not to be taken in and deceived by those people who claim to be believers and teachers, but who were not. So don't be deceived by them. Uh, today's passage, though, is, is much more positive. At least it's most, more positive in the, in the first half. In the first half of today's passage, John wants to encourage his readers by reminding them of the great privileges that they enjoy as true believers. So that's in the, in the first half of today's passage. In the second half of today's passage, he goes on to exhort his readers not to love the world or anything in the world. So today's passage is in two parts. There's encouragement followed by exhortation. And so let's turn now to the first half, which is in verses 12 to 14. And in these verses, John addresses, uh, and if you've got your Bible open, it might help. He addresses children, fathers, and young men. Uh, so uh, you'll see that if you've got your Bible open. He mentions children in verse 12, and then in verse 13, he mentions fathers, and then he, and then he mentions young men. And then he addresses all three again. So he mentions children at the end of verse 13, then he mentions fathers at the beginning of verse 14, and then he mentions young men again in the second half of verse 14. So it's children, fathers, young men, children, fathers, young men. Some of the uh, commentators uh, suggest that John is addressing believers at different stages in their Christian life. So uh, the children are those who are new to the faith, Fathers are those who are mature in the faith, and the young men are, are somewhere in between. They're not new believers, but they're not yet mature believers. And uh, while that's a common interpretation, uh, we should note that elsewhere in this letter, John addresses all of his readers, all of his readers as children. For instance, uh, look at verse 1 of chapter 2, where he writes, My dear children, I write this to you. Then there's verse 18 of chapter 2, where he writes, Dear children, this is the last hour. Look now at verse 28 of chapter 2, where he writes, And now, dear children. And then there's verse 18 of chapter 3, Dear children, let us not love with words, and so on. And there are other references. When John is addressing all of his readers, he addresses all of them as children. And that tells us something about... Uh, the affection he had for them. You know, he loves them as if they were his own children. But the fact that elsewhere he refers to all of his readers as his children suggests that when he addresses the children in verses 12 and 13, he's addressing not some of his readers, but all of his readers. Not just some of them, but all of them. And addressing all of them he then divides his readers into uh, two groups, fathers and young men. And when he refers to, to fathers and young men, he's not referring to their spiritual maturity, but he's referring to their physical maturity. He's addressing older men in the church and younger men in the church, or we might say older people and younger people. The Apostle Paul uh, does something similar in 1 Timothy when he advises Timothy on how to treat older men and women and younger men and, and women. So having clarified who he's addressing, let's think about what he said to his dear children, all of the readers. In verse 12, he tells them that he's writing to them because their sins have been forgiven on account of his name. That is, their sins have been forgiven on account of Christ's name. And this is true of every believer, isn't it? Uh, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we receive forgiveness from God. God pardons us for all that we have done wrong, and he continues to forgive us. He promises to remember our sins no more. He promises to remove them from us as far as the east is from the west. He promises to cover them up and blot them out. All of those expressions from the Bible reassure the believer that God will not count our sins against us. He'll not hold them against us. Someone else 
can't forget what we have done to them. They hold a grudge. They won't forgive us. No matter what we do, they will not forget what we did. And what we did always comes between us. But God isn't like that because he promises to forgive us for all that we have done wrong. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered, says the psalmist. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him. And the reason God is able to uh, forgive us like that is because of Christ who took the blame for us and who bore the punishment we deserve and who paid for all our sins when he gave up his life on the cross. As John has already said in his letter, the blood of Jesus or the death of Jesus purifies us uh, from all sin. The guilt of our sin is washed away because Christ died for us. And uh, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, John has already told us. In other words, he offered himself, Jesus offered himself on the cross as the perfect sacrifice which turned God's wrath and curse away from us and onto him. And because he suffered the punishment we deserve, God is able to pardon us. Dear children, says John, and he's addressing every believer, your sins have been forgiven on account of Christ's name. Jump down now to the end of verse 13 where he says to his dear children, all of his readers, I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. That is, you have come to know him. Whenever we believe in the Lord Jesus, it's as if he takes us by the hand and he leads us to the Father in heaven, and he introduces us to him. But, it, but it's even better than that, because the Lord Jesus doesn't introduce us to God by saying, uh, this is my Father. No, he introduces us uh, to the Father by saying to us, this is your Father now. Through faith in Christ, God becomes our Father in heaven, and our Father in heaven promises to love us with a never-ending never love and to care for us and to watch over us always. And so, dear children, your sins have been forgiven on account of Christ's name, and you've come to know the Father. And having addressed every believer, he then addresses, John then addresses fathers. Uh, that is, he's addressing the older members of the church. And to encourage them, uh, he reminds them that they have known, or they've come to know, him who is from the beginning. And he's referring to the Lord Jesus, isn't he? We, we know that because back in verse 1 of chapter 1, uh, John referred to the Lord Jesus as the word of life who was from the beginning. And so he who is from the beginning is the Lord Jesus. He's from the beginning because he's the eternal son of God who was before all things. And when the time was right, the eternal son of God came uh, to earth as one of us and the apostles heard him and they saw him they touched him and they've testified to all that he said and did so that we too may know him we haven't seen him with our own eyes we haven't uh, uh, heard him with our own ears we haven't touched him with our own hands but we know him because the apostles have testified to all he said and did they wrote it down for us to, to read and so we know him, we know what he's like, we know what he's done for us, we know we can trust in him, we know that we can expect him to come again one day, we have come to know him. And this is such a privilege that John mentions it twice, at the beginning of verse 13 and then at the beginning of verse 14. And John may be emphasizing this because some of the false teachers in those days were claiming that they had secret knowledge of God. They claim to know things which uh, ordinary Christians did not know. God had revealed secret things, secret knowledge to them. But don't worry about their so-called secret knowledge, John seems to be saying. Don't worry about that. Because you've come to know the main thing, the most important thing. You've come to know the Savior. And then John addresses the younger people in the church and, and he encourages them by reminding them in verse 13 that they have overcome the evil one, who's the devil. 
And I've said before that the devil has uh, two weapons against the church. One is persecution and the other is false teaching. So he tries to destroy our faith by persecution or by leading us astray with false doctrine. And uh, given that the background to this letter and to what we know about certain people in the church at that time who didn't believe what the apostles taught, then what John says here, or when John says here that they have overcome the evil one, he, he means that they, they haven't been taken in by false doctrine. The devil hasn't been able to lead them astray. They've continued to hold on to the true gospel and to believe what the apostles taught. So they have overcome the evil one by standing firm in the faith. And then he also encourages them at the end of verse 40 by saying that they are strong. Uh, in what sense are they strong? Well, he's not referring to physical strength, but to being strong in the faith. And they're strong in the faith because the word of God lives in them. It, it abides in them. It remains in them. And so they are strong in the faith and have overcome the evil one. And this is one of the reasons uh, we always read and study the Bible on Sundays. This is why everyone is encouraged to read and study the Bible on other occasions, whether it's on your own or with your family or with other believers. The way to become strong in the faith and to resist the devil is by knowing God's word so that it becomes part of us. Uh, we all need to know what God has revealed about himself and about our salvation, about how Christ is coming again and about how we're to live in the world while we wait for Christ to come. If we don't know the Bible, then we'll be deceived by false teaching and we'll be led astray from the true faith. And so the way to reinforce our faith, the way to, to build a barricade around our faith, the way to stand firm in the faith is by knowing and believing God's word. John was writing to encourage his readers and he encouraged them by reminding them that their sins have been forgiven because of Christ. And they've come to know the Father and they've come to know Jesus Christ the Savior. They've become strong and have overcome the evil one because the word of God lives in them. And if you're a believer, then you too can be encouraged because your sins have been forgiven, no matter what they are. They've been forgiven because of Christ. You know the Father. You know the Father's love and his care. You know the Savior and how he gave up his life for you. And you have God's word to make you strong. That's the first part of today's passage. That's the encouragement for believers. And now we have the exhortation in verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world, says John. And at first glance, this might puzzle us. After all, didn't God make the world? Uh, didn't he make the world good? Uh, doesn't he fill the world with good things for us to enjoy? Uh, why shouldn't we love the world which God has made? But we need to remember that the world we now live in is, is a fallen world uh, which has been spoiled by sin. And there are things in the world which are not from God and which are therefore not good. And John goes on in verse 16 to explain for us what those things are which are in the world and which are not good. So take a look at verse 16 now where he refers to three things. And in my translation it says the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has or does. A better translation of the phrase the cravings of sinful man is the desire of the flesh. The desire of the flesh. A flesh in the Bible refers to our fallen sinful nature. Because of Adam's sin in the beginning, all of us are born with a fallen, sinful nature. So that we're naturally inclined to sin against God. And so the phrase, the desire of the flesh, refers to those sinful desires and inclinations which we all have because we're sinners. Now at least one of the commentators suggests that, and I think he's right, that the phrase of the desire of the flesh is, is a general term. It, it's a broad category. But John gets more specific when he goes on to refer to the lust of his eyes 
and to the boasting of what he has and does. Uh, a better translation of the phrase, the lust of the eyes, is the desire of the eyes. And, and John is referring to, to sinful desires which are activated by what we see. Now, there might be nothing wrong with what we see because the world around us does speak to us of God's glory and goodness. And there's an infinite variety of things around us in the world which God has made and they're good. And God fills our lives with good things which we're to receive with thanksgiving. But a problem arises when our desire for those good things is sinful. What we see may lead to covetousness and to a sinful desire for things which are not rightfully ours. So think of the story of Achan from the book of Joshua. Do you remember uh, this, his story after the Lord brought down the walls of Jericho? Uh, uh, Achan was among the Israelites who entered the city to fight against the, the, uh, the inhabitants, and the Lord gave them uh, victory over their enemies. But the Lord also gave it strict instructions that the Israelites were not to take anything from the city. Everything was to be devoted to the Lord. That is, everything was to be destroyed. But Achan, who was in the city, uh, uh, saw a beautiful robe and some silver and some gold. He saw those things. And there was nothing wrong with those things. The robe was beautiful and there's nothing sinful about silver and gold. But Achan wanted those things for himself, even though the Lord had forbidden it. And so his desire for those things was sinful. Achan looked and he wanted and he took those things which were forbidden to him. And that's an example of what John means when he refers to the desire of the eyes. It's the sinful desire which is activated in us by what we see. And John goes on to refer to boasting of what we have and do. And the emphasis here is not so much on what we do, but it's in what we have. It's about taking pride, uh, sinful pride in our possessions, boasting about what we own, being puffed up with pride because of what we possess. The problem is not so much what we possess, but it's our sinful attitude towards what we possess. And John's referring to our, our sinful pride and to sinful boasting about what we own. And so when John exhorts us not to love the world, he's thinking about how there are things in the world which are not from God and which are therefore not good. And the things he's thinking about are the desire of the flesh, which includes those sinful desires which are activated by what we see. And he's thinking about our sinful boasting about what we possess. In other words, he's talking about things that are inside of us, not out there in the world, they're inside of us. And John says in verse 16, these things are not from the Father. Since they're not from the Father, they're not good, they're not right. They come from us. So having clarified what John means by loving the world, let's go back now to verse 15 where John says that if anyone loves the world, so if anyone loves the world with that sinful desire which we've been thinking about, then the love of the Father is not in him. So again, think of Achan. Uh, if he really loved God more than anything else, he wouldn't have taken that beautiful robe and that gold and silver. If he loved God more than those things, he wouldn't have taken them because God had forbidden it. And his desire to please God would have been greater than his desire for those things. And then John adds that we should not love the world in this sinful way because the world and its desires pass away. So the world around us the world around us, it's destined to perish. It's all going to come to an end when the Lord Jesus comes again in glory and with power to create a new heaven and earth. And so what we see around us is temporary. It will not last. But the man or the woman who does the will of God lives forever. So people spend a lifetime uh, trying to get more and more stuff for themselves. Whatever they see, they want. They gather around them uh, everything they, they can and uh, everything that they can afford. Uh, if they can't afford something that they want, well, they might be tempted to steal it. 
And if they don't steal it, then maybe they're just miserable because they can't have what they want. But their whole life consists in what they have and what they want. And it's all going to pass away. It will not last. But then there's a believer who loves the Lord and who wants to do his will here on earth. And the believer may not have very much in this world. But it doesn't matter because he knows, she knows that they will have eternal life. And they'll come into the presence of God one day and they will see him. And they will have fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore in the world to come. Or that believer who loves the Lord and who wants to do his will here on earth might actually have many possessions in this world. You know, God distributes his gifts to his people however he likes. So that believer may have lots, but it doesn't matter to him or to her because they know that all of it will pass away. It's all temporary. And what they really want, what they really desire more than anything else is to do God's will in this life. And then afterwards, to see him. And how do we become like that? How do we become the kind of people who love God more than anything else? Well, we turn to God and we ask him to make us like that. Because he's the one who's able to take away our love for other things and to give us a love for him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please forgive us if we're the kind of person who loves other things more than you. Forgive us, Lord God, for our sinful desires, which are so often activated by the things that we see around us. Forgive us, Lord God, for sinful boasting about what we own. Uh, forgive us, Lord God, for all our sins and shortcomings, and we pray that you will come into all of our lives by your Spirit, and that you'll enable those who don't yet believe to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and the hope of everlasting life. And will you come into our lives and enable us to love you more than all other things, so that our heart's desire, our chief end in life, will be to glorify you. And we pray this in our Saviour's name. Amen. Let's stand to sing, Be Thou My Vision.
and go forth in the name of the Lord. This is God's charge. We should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.